Well, welcome to our traveling church, traveling road show. And uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ross Gilbert, and I'm the, the lead pastor here at uh, New Life Fellowship. And we're, we're privileged and honored to have you here this morning uh, for this, this message. And I have this great honor and privilege uh, throughout the week where I get to sit and meet with people who come and they share all sorts of struggles with me, whether it be struggles in their marriage, struggles in their their um, relationship with their families, with their kids, whether it be issues they're struggling from their past, be it uh, addictions, there's all kinds of things that, that we, we deal with. And I get to, to meet with these people. And it's an honor that they would come and they would, they would share with me and that they would open up. And so when I first meet with them, I try, to, I try to ask a lot of questions and try and listen as much as I can to try to get a sense of where they're at. And inevitably, they'll often come to a point where they'll look at me and they'll kind of stare me in the eyes and they'll say, is that okay that I share that? Is it okay that I, I, I revealed that to you? And what they're essentially asking, what they're essentially trying to do is find out whether they're still okay. See, that, that first first time I meet with them is very much like an interview where it's not so much that I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me. They're trying to figure out where, where do they stand? Am I a trustworthy person? Am I a safe person? And they're trying to understand that and figure that out. And, and so they're, when they're asking that question, am I okay? They're just worried about now that I've shared that, now that I've revealed that to you, are you going to reject me? Am I, am I disgusting? Am I, is it still safe for me to be here? And and because that's the question I think we're all trying to figure out. Am I enough? Am I too much? Do I have what it takes? Or basically, am I worthy of being loved? And and that's that's a question that I think every person struggles with probably every day. And that's what makes this passage that we're going to look at this morning in Ephesians so powerful, so significant, because it's going to answer that question for us in a resounding way so that we could hopefully experience the freedom that God's given to us. So the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 again. We, we studied that the last time we were in Ephesians, but there's so much here we're going to pause and spend a bit more time in there. And it's a famous passage, maybe the most famous passage in the whole book of Ephesians. But uh, read it along up here with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Let's pray. Father, we're looking forward to what you have in store for us, what you have planned for us. And Father, you're going to do something powerful, I believe, this morning as we start to understand what it means to be saved by grace and not by works, and how we can live and experience life in you as you intended, as you planned. So we're trusting you to be a teacher. We're trusting you to do something powerful and and speak past the things that we think we already know to see how it applies to our lives each and every day. In your name we pray, amen. So in this passage here, what Paul's doing is he's contrasting two different systems. This this workspace, or really, really, another way we could refer to it is this law system versus grace. So really, that's what this passage is about. It's law versus grace. Achieving something versus receiving something. And that achieving is going to be based on your performance, based on your behavior, whereas receiving is just something that you get that you didn't deserve. Notice I use the term verses, law versus grace. Often people talk about law and grace. And, and it's just, I hear from people often, they say this, we need to balance law and grace. This is the fear almost that we, if, you know, we have too much law, that's going to lead to legalism. But if you have too much grace, that's going to lead to license. And so we need to balance the two, find the nice, sweet middle spot between law and between grace, and that's going to keep us on the straight and narrow. As if there's something is too much grace. And the reality is you can't have too much grace, but you can't have too much law. And so really what what happens is I think they're trying to balance that. They're trying to have that, keep that tension between law and grace because they don't understand grace, but no, neither do they really understand the law. 
And that's what we're going to try to focus in this morning is understand what was the intent of the law? What was God's thinking? What was his purpose behind the law? So let's begin to understand what the Bible is referring to when we read this idea or read this word, the law. So the law is a set of rules. It was given to Moses when Israel left Egypt, right, on Mount Sinai, when they were preparing to enter into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And and the law would include the Ten Commandments, but it would be much more than that. There were 613 commands throughout the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. And that would make up the law. Often it's called the Mosaic Law because it was given to Moses. Now, theologians, what they've done is they've divided up the law into three categories. You would have the the moral law, which would largely be comprised of the Ten Commandments, such as don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't commit murder, and so forth, right? So they would call that the moral law. And then there's what they would refer to as the civil law. And the civil law would be basically, now how do we interact with one another? So if your ox comes into my farmland and eats up all my crops, what are you going to do about it, right? So that would be the civil law of it. And then there was the ceremonial law, which talked about what kind of food you eat. Avoid shellfish, avoid bacon and pork and and so forth. And and don't wear clothes and mix fibers and such, right? How do you worship? How do you sacrifice? How, How do you keep clean and so forth, right? So they had all these ceremonial laws. And so basically, you could take all 613 laws and try to divide it up into one of those three categories, And in Israel, they saw that list of standards. They saw that as if they could measure up in these areas, then God would be pleased with them, that God would would accept them, that they were doing well. And so it was important. In fact, the role of a rabbi was basically trying to help you understand what did that law mean? How do we apply it in this situation? So what does it mean to honor the Sabbath? What does it mean to not work? What does that look like? And so they would have another set of rules, another set of laws that would apply it. And that's happening today. The number one question I get from people day in, day out is, how do I do it? Tell me what to do. And that's essentially what they're trying to do. Figure out, well, what's the law? And now how do I apply that into my life here today? And so that's kind of the question that these rabbis would be getting over and over again. But it was more than just, how do I know if I'm accepted by God? See, for the Jews, the law system that came in, it it came with a bunch of curses and a bunch of blessings. The idea that if you could somehow do everything right, if you could follow the rules and measure up and be successful, then God would bless you. You'd be the head, not the tail. You would lend and not have to borrow. You'd be successful in your business and your storehouses would always be full and overflowing. Your children would love you and listen to you. Oh, if only, right? So they'd they'd have all that. But then if you failed, if you didn't measure up, In fact, if you blew it in one spot, then it came with a whole list of curses that you would be the tail, not the head, and that you would have to to borrow and not lend, and your kids wouldn't listen to you, and your storehouses would be empty, and you would struggle, and you would suffer, and on and on and on. And so for the Jew, this, this law was serious stuff. It was so critical that they understand, how do I do it? Because they had so much riding on. God's appreciation, God's acceptance of them, and then success in this world as well. That was for the Jew. And unless you were born a Jew, the law really doesn't apply to you. Because remember, God didn't give the law to the world. God gave the law to Moses for the Jews. It's a very Jewish thing. But that doesn't mean that you and I, as Gentiles, didn't have our own sets of laws. In fact, Romans 2 talks about that in verse 14, how we instinctively did the law, even though it wasn't given to us, that shows that the law was essentially written on our hearts. That this idea of don't murder and don't lie and don't steal and don't commit adultery, that wasn't limited to the Jews. The whole world knew that. I mean, think about Pharaoh in Egypt. He knew adultery was wrong when Abraham, 400 years before the law ever showed up, So they had this. We've all had this kind of written on our hearts. And so we don't have the law, the Mosaic law per se, but instead I think we all grew up with what Paul calls this elementary principles of the world, or what I like to refer to as a law system, meaning we have our own set, our own kind of law that we begin to look to and trust in and depend upon. So let's define what I mean by the law system. So the law system is a system of rules standards or expectations that may or may not include parts of the Mosaic law, 
which we use to determine if through our behavior we're successful enough to earn love, acceptance, and blessing, or if we failed and are worthy of rejection and punishment. So this system of rules, this, this standards, these expectations that you and I think, if I can just master this, if I could just somehow accomplish in these areas, then God will accept me, others will accept me, I'll be successful, and life will be easy. Life will work for us. Now think about how many times this has been true in your life in terms of how you've approached life. And, and here's some evidence of that. How many times have you approached God with this idea, bargaining with God? God, if I just do this, will you do this for me? If, 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 I, if I, you know, read my Bible and if I pray more and if I just, I get closer to you, will you somehow heal my marriage, fix the relationship with my kids, give me peace, give me joy? So much of our approach to life is thinking, what do I need to do to qualify and earn this blessing from God? Because I've gotten this, this thinking, this mindset that God's withholding his blessing from me because there's something wrong in my life. And if I just figure that out and I clean it up, then God's blessing will be released. It will begin to flow. Maybe I just begin, need to begin to give more at church or, or I just got to memorize scripture verses or I got to you know, help out in a nursery or ministry or, or whatever it is. What do I need to do to unlock, unleash God's blessing in my life? All of that is evidence of this law system. Now, where does this come from? Well, this law system is going to come from a number of different factors and it's going to be based on how you've grown up. Now, if you grew up in the church, they're likely going to have a huge influence on what you deem to be acceptable or not. You see, the, the church, and, and particularly the domination of your church, will begin to influence what's right and what's wrong. So the church often will begin to lay out a, a what is acceptable and often will include the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, don't lie, don't murder, etc. But it may, it may begin to define what other activities are okay or not. For example, gambling, or playing cards, or going and watching movies, and what kind of movies you watch. We all know TV is off limits, right? So, I mean, there's all kinds of things like that. What music you listen to, and so forth. I, I grew up in a tradition where dancing was, was frowned upon. I mean, it was, people would have dances at weddings, and the, the, everyone part of that church would get up and leave the wedding at that point. I mean, I kind of joked that the reason they preached against premarital sex is because they were afraid it might lead to dancing. <laughs> I mean, it was serious stuff, right? And, and so that's sort of how, how, you know, part of what I grew up with, that this is what's acceptable, this is what pleases God, and this is what's not acceptable. Our, our society and our culture will have an impact on this. And, and you might try to deny it and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm immune from it, but you're not. For example, what's the correct age for a mother to wean her child from nursing? Is it one-year-old? Is it two? Is it three? What about when the child actually has to bend down to nurse? Is that, is that when it's wrong? Like, at what point does it become wrong? And you see, the, the reality is that we don't, there is nothing. There is no right or wrong. But as society, oh, we've defined it. How do you know? Because when you see the child asking for mommy to lift up her shirt, people go, ooh. Because society's begun to define what's right and wrong. It tells us about fashions. It tells us about music and movies and, and how we talk. I mean, I don't know how many times people have said to me, oh, you can't say that. You can't talk like that. And, and so we've defined what's acceptable. Politically correct is the extreme, but there's varying degrees of all that. And, and notice that some of it might overlap. Some of it might overlap with the church, but some of it might contradict with the church. And, and that's what we're seeing today, where the church might say one thing about abortion and LGBTQ rights, and then society says something very different. And now what do we do? And so there's some conflict here. And people struggle with that conflict internally. And, and some, some resolve it by chucking one and, and holding to the other. But there's, there's now some issues there. 
And then there's our family. Our family has a huge impact on what we think is appropriate or not. Do you need a university degree? What kind of a job is right? You know, does it have to be white collar? Does it have to be blue collar? Um, how many children are acceptable to have in a family? What kind of roles does the man do and what kind of roles does a woman do? For division of chores and, and so forth. And then there's your own current family, your spouse and your kids and what they expect of you, what you're supposed to do and so forth. What do I need to do to keep them happy? So we've got the church, we've got society, we've got our family, but you know who's got the biggest impact on all that? It's ourselves. It's our own personal standards, our own personal laws that we place on ourselves, that we determine what do I need to do to make sure that I know I'm okay based on my appearance, based on how I carry myself, based on the kind of job that I have, based on the house I live in and the car I drive or the, the friends that I keep. How am I doing? And we begin to evaluate, based on all these laws, all these standards, where do I fit? And, and am I doing enough to be worthy of acceptance, to be worthy of love? And so you add all this up together, and you have your own personal law. So in my case, I'd had the law of Ross, and Sheila had the law of Sheila. And there might be some overlap, and there might be some different things. But we each have our own set of laws that we're looking to, we're, we're depending upon to determine whether or not we're okay. And again, you don't know you have them often until you fail. Until you blow it. And then, then you find out what other people's expectations were of yourself. But more importantly, what your own expectations were of yourself. Because you, you begin to beat up yourself. Begin to kick yourself. And so here's the mistake we make. We recognize that, and we, we look back and go, oh, my goodness, I'm, I'm trying to please everybody, and I can't please everybody. You know what I need to do? I need to show grace to myself by lowering my expectations. How many people have had that thought? You know, there's nothing gracious about that. There's nothing gracious about lowering the expectations, because all that is is shuffling the chairs on the Titanic, you see, the problem isn't the, the, the level of expectation that you have on yourself. It's not a matter of just lowering it to make it easier to cross over. The problem with it is the whole system. There's nothing gracious lowering the system. It, it, it's kind of akin to saying, um, I'm going to be really gracious to you and really loving to you. I'm going to put less arsenic in your water. Isn't that nice? You're welcome. You're welcome, right? I mean, I'm still giving you death. And that's the thing about the law system that we don't understand, is the law always ministers death and condemnation. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and 9. It's a minister of death. It's a minister of condemnation. That's what it delivers to you and I. So it's not about lowering the standard because you're guaranteed to fail. It's about finding another way to live. So before we can do that, we got to understand the law in more terms, in better terms. And mainly, why did God give the law then? And please understand, the law was never intended to be a pathway to life. It was never meant to be not just life in terms of salvation, but it was never meant to be a guidebook or a model as how you and I are to live today. That was not the purpose of it. We're going to look at three purposes. Number one, in, in Romans 7, verse 7, listen to what Paul says about the law. And again, he's talking about the Mosaic law. Specifically, he's actually talking about the Ten Commandments, one in particular. But it, it would apply to any law system. He says, what should we say? Is the law sin? Is the law bad? May it never be. Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with the law. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. See, what the law does is the law defines what sin is, which is really, really important, especially today, where we live in a society where, where truth and right and wrong are deemed to be relative and flexible. And what's right for you may not be right for me, and, and my truth might be different than your truth, and there is no absolute truth. I can absolutely state that. 
Well, the reality is there is right and wrong. There is an authority in all that. And, and we don't get to decide what's right or wrong. Because if we do, that would make us the authority. That would make us to be God. And that's exactly, essentially, the lie that the serpent gave to Eve in the garden. Eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's right and wrong. Essentially, eat of the law system, and you will be like God. You can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. But that's not what makes, we're never God. We don't have that authority. So what does God do? He came and he gave to man so there'd be no longer any doubt, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Think about it. We do this in our own world, in our own society all the time. A number of years ago, they introduced a new law in Ontario that if you are driving your car and texting on your phone while eating your breakfast sandwich, while combing your hair and shaving your legs and putting on your deodorant, that's a bad idea. Just in case, and, and it's crazy, you laugh at that, but that's what people were doing and still are some of us, right? And so it's happening. And so they had to introduce a law so that everyone would know that's a bad idea. Don't do that while driving, right? And so that's what essentially God was saying. Just so we're clear, we're all on the same page. This is what sin looks like. And he defines sin, especially the coveting. Because you can't think about it. coveting. I mean, it's like, it's like the victimless crime, isn't it? It's only happening in my mind. Nobody has to know about it. And God says, no, no, that's sin. And Paul, he says, I didn't know that was sin. I didn't realize that was wrong until the law said, don't covet. I'm like, oh, so that's, that's not okay. All right. So it defines sin. Now think about this. If, if knowing what's right or wrong and wanting to do what's right and avoid what's wrong, you would expect the number of sin to go down, wouldn't you? That would be the normal response. That, that this is now what's going to guard me. This is what's going to protect me. This is what's going to keep me on the straight and narrow. But that's not what the law was intended for. See, in Romans 7, in verse 5, it says, For while we're in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. The sinful passions were aroused by what? The law. Goes on in verse 8, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin taking an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. See, the law doesn't control or guard against sinful behavior. All it does is it stirs it up. It makes it worse. You see, that's, the, I think, the greatest misunderstanding we have with the law is we think it's what's going to protect us from sin. Remember that tension I said earlier? How we're trying to balance law and grace, and we think we, we, we don't want to be so legalistic, but we've got to have the law, right? It's got to be like in, in our, we've got to be able to touch it still, because that's what's going to prevent us from becoming so licensed and, and free and sinful. But the law stirs it up. In fact, Romans 6.14, Paul says, For law shall not be for, sorry, sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. Meaning when you're going back to the law, when you're trusting in the law to keep you in check, what will master you? Sin. Because that's what sin does. It stirs it up. It makes it worse. Here's what Paul was saying. He's, he thought, he thought, you know what? I want to be the best Christian I can be. And you know what? If I, if I don't covet, you know what? That's kind of the, a key. Because think about it. How many sins come from coveting? Why do, why do people steal? Because they're coveting. Why do they cheat? Because they're coveting. Why do they murder? Often because they're coveting. So if I just master not coveting, man, that will wipe away 60% of my sin. Oh, man, if I just don't covet, if I don't lust, that will make me a great Christian. That was his desire. But that was the deception. This command, this guardrail, this, this rule, this standard that I thought was going to provide life for me, Paul says, only resulted in death, because it only stirs it up, makes it worse. Let me illustrate. 
flow. So glad you're here this morning. You're getting nervous, aren't you? It's real. I got one simple request of you. Simple. Whatever you do, don't think about giraffes. All right? Don't think about dancing giraffes. Don't think about giraffes talking. Don't think about giraffes kind of walking through the field or chewing on, you know, the, the, the leaves. Don't, don't think about giraffes. Long necks. Just don't think about giraffes. All right? It's really important. Don't, I mean, we have one simple rule here in your life. Don't think about giraffes. All right? So, by, by the way, what are you thinking about right now? Oh, Flo. <laughs> All right, Flo, this is a safe place. We love you here. Um, can, you, can you tell me how long you've struggled with this sin of, of draft thinking? I mean, it's safe. We love you. But 30 seconds. Why? What happens? The moment I said, don't, what did you do? You did. Because that's, that's what the law is meant to do. It's meant to, to stir it up. The more you fix on it, the more you fixate on it, the more obsessed you become with it. For example, if you're driving a car and you start thinking, don't hit the light pole, 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 don't hit the... You introduce yourself to the light pole. Right? Because that's what it's doing. It's just stirring it up. And that was the point of the law. It was to shine a giant spotlight on sin. I, I like to think of this illustration. It's like those makeup mirrors, you know, those ones that have like amplification of like 800 times and, and not just like an amplification, but they got the light because you need the light, right? And that bright light on there. And so it's shining in so much so the bacteria is like, oh, oh my goodness, like turn that off, right? I mean, and you see the reaction to it because it's so amplified. Well, that's what the law was doing. It was amplifying, it was stirring up sin. So we go, oh, there it is. There's the problem. But it was never meant to be the cure. That would be like taking this mirror and going, wow, that's a dirty face. I'm going to clean it by rubbing the mirror against my face. I mean, that's foolish, right? It's stupid to do that because that's not the job of the mirror. In the same way, it's not the job of the law. The law wasn't meant to control, contain sin. It was meant to amplify it. Why? So that it would lead us running to Jesus. Listen to what Paul says in, to the churches of Galatia. In chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, he says, Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, our child guide, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified, made righteous, made acceptable by faith. That's the saved by grace part. But look what he says. But now, today, after salvation, now that faith has come, we're no longer under the child guide. We don't need the law anymore. See, the law leads us to give up on ourselves and to run to Jesus for acceptance. Because again, what does the law do? It kills and condemns. All it does is it points out your failures. You blew it. You weren't good enough. You didn't have what it takes. You failed over and over and over again. And all it's doing is it's telling us over and over again that in and of myself, I can do nothing. Which is exactly what Jesus told us in John 15. That there's nothing I can do, nothing I can bring to the table to make this happen. And I need another. I need Jesus. I need to come to him and trust in him and his strength and his power to do that which I cannot do. And so it, it leads me running to Jesus so that I can come to him and experience life in him rather than trying to earn it and find it on my own. So the law, after telling me over and over again, that I am not enough, I run to Jesus and he says, but I can make you enough. I will accept you. I will love you. And my love for you is enough. My acceptance for you is more than anything you need. And we embrace that at salvation, but watch what happens now. At salvation, we accept that. We go, thank you, God, that I could never be good enough. 
You know, just sort of come to Jesus as you are. And so we came to Jesus in our midst because he loves a sinner and we're dirty and we're awful and we're ugly. And he says, it's okay, I love you and I accept you. But then the moment you're saved, it's like a bait and switch. You were okay when you were a sinner. Come to me just as you are. But now that you're saved, you better, you better start getting your act together. I mean, now, now that, that's not okay anymore. Now, now you gotta, you gotta clean that up. You gotta, you gotta make sure you stop doing that and you should start doing this and start doing this. And, and here's some, some guidelines and some principles for you to follow and make sure you're doing this and not doing that. And, and now all of a sudden, a whole series of standards and expectations and laws and rules and principles and guidelines and whatever we want to call them are slammed down on our shoulders. And suddenly now we feel this weight of not being enough, not measuring up, big failure. And yet God loves me because he has to. But boy, is he ever disappointed with me. Boy, is he ever frustrated. I just keep, I just can't seem to get it together. No matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to, can't seem to make it work. And so what we end up doing now is we think, okay, what do I need to do to earn acceptance? And so life, life sort of takes on this flavor. My acceptance is based on doing things to please God and other people and avoiding things that displeases God and other people. So what do I need to do to please my spouse, to please my kids, please my friends, please my family, and please God? And what do I have to avoid to make everyone happy and love me? And if I can just, if I can just find that, that magical formula, that sweet spot in life, then I'll find life. Then I'll find acceptance, and God will bless me. Can anyone relate to this, this way of thinking? That's not what he wants. It was not saved by grace and now go back to the law. It was saved by grace so you didn't need the law anymore. Because the moment the law sent you running for Jesus, it had finished. It was done. It had done its job. It wasn't designed to keep you in check. It wasn't designed to, to help you live. It was just designed to send you to Jesus. But now that you've got Jesus, you don't need anything else. Let's let's read it this way. In in Romans chapter 7, I I think only verse 4 is going to be here on the slide, but I'm going to read read verses 1 to 4. Paul says, he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, See, Romans chapter 7, it's all about the believer's relationship to the law. And he says, he's made these these controversial statements about the law, particularly in Romans 6, 14, where he says, for sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. You're freed from the law. And he's made that statement. He knows his his readers, a lot of them are Jews in this church, are like, they're pulling their hair out. They're going crazy. Like, no, the, the law is everything. The law, we, we can never give up the law. That's our Jewish character. We, we need the law still. And he says, okay, brethren, those, those who know the law, fellow Jews, and today, you have, like me who grew up in the church, who hold on to those laws, he says, listen to this. The law is jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Every time I read the, jurisdiction, the word jurisdiction, I think of Duke of, Dukes of Hazard. Right? Bo and Luke Duke, right? Living in Hazard County, which was the weirdest place on earth, right? Because think about it. If you watch the show, the county seemingly was surrounded by a series of jumps. I mean, that's weird, right? Like, it's just odd. And, and every show, every, every show had Bo and Luke Duke at some point trying to evade Sheriff Roscoe Pico train, heading to the county line encountering a jump because that's what they're surrounded by, jumping over the county line. Why? To evade the authority. They left the jurisdiction and therefore the sheriff could no longer touch them. Giant pot, plot hole, by the way. Eventually they come back into town, like do something then, right? But anyway, it's not, then never mind. So, so that's what jurisdiction means, authority, dominion, power, control. And Paul says the, the law has power 
control and authority over someone as long as they live. So let's imagine right now, in downtown, we're in Breslau, downtown Breslau right now. There's got to be a downtown, right? Somewhere? <laughs> no? All right. In the, the busiest part of Breslau, there's an ATM machine. Not a bank, just an ATM machine, right? And a guy, he, he, he's robbing the ATM machine, but a police officer rolls up. And police officers are well-trained, right, Barry? I mean, they're well-trained. They see if a guy's there with a black ski mask on in the middle of summer robbing an ATM machine, that's curious behavior, right? So he begins to pursue this guy, and this guy takes off in his getaway car and, and driving madly, and he spins out of control, and he dies in a car accident. Well, at this point, does a police officer arrest him? Put him on trial, convict him, because they got him dead of rights. Sorry. And, and send him off to prison. Is that what we do? No, why not? Because he's dead. The moment he died, he left the jurisdiction of the authority. Does that make sense? That's essentially what Paul's saying. But he's going to illustrate it to us through a different relationship, a marriage relationship, using a husband and a wife. Right? And so he says here, in verses 2 and 3, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law, so she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. So he's basically saying, think about marriage, husband and wife. How long are they married for? Till death do us part, Right? So if, if she then goes and tries to join herself, marries another guy while husband's still alive, what's that? Adultery. But if husband dies and she goes and marries someone else, that's okay. Now, please understand, this is not a sermon on marriage and divorce and remarriage. It's not the point here. What he's trying to give as illustration is you're bound. He's going to apply it in verse 4 for us. You see, the reality is you and I, when we showed up here on planet Earth, we were bound to the law system to this elementary principles of this world, of striving, of struggling, earning, achieving for acceptance and blessing and honor. And you are married to it. But then in verse 4, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may, might be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So think about it. On that cross, not just that Jesus died to forgive you of all the times you failed to measure up to those standards. He says, you also were made to die. You also were placed in Jesus Christ. You also were crucified on that cross. Why is that so important? Because the moment you died, what happened to your marriage to the law system? It's broken. It's finished. The law has lost jurisdiction and authority over you. You're free from it. You've been released from it, it says in verse 6. No longer does it have any control on you. Why? So that you could be born again, raised up as a brand new creation in order that you would be joined to who? To Jesus. To another. And that's why you don't need the law. We've got something way better. We've got, some, we've got Jesus. I like, I like to use this illustration. Imagine, imagine you have a dinner party and you're going to invite a bunch of friends over and you want to impress these people. You want to, you want to show off a little bit. So you go get Martha Stewart's cookbook or, or book on dinner parties. And in there, in Martha Stewart's book, she's got all kinds of things, like decorations and, and, and food and appetizers and main course, like everything, everything you can imagine, how to make great dinner parties. And, and there's more than just one option. Like she's got a whole list of options. Some are really easy, you know, Go buy a bag of cookies and napkins. Done, right? And some are more difficult. Well, you want to impress everybody, so you go find, you know, the, the five Martha Stewart face option, right? The most difficult option out there. And they go, okay, this, I'm going to do it. And, and so you break open the book and you start reading through it. And all of a sudden, Martha Stewart walks through your door herself. And you're like, oh, that's so great. You're here. This is awesome. Wait to see what I'm going to do. And you go back to the book, and you read the book, trying to follow all the steps to create 
the food and the decorations and the ambiance and so forth. All while Martha Stewart just sort of sitting in the corner. Would that make sense? Or, or would it make more sense to say, I don't, I, I got something better than the book. I've got, I've got the author. Martha Stewart herself is here. Martha, can, can we do this together? Sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to fold the eggs. And I look at it at that point, you fold laundry, not eggs. Like, <laughs> what do you mean by that, right? But I'll show you. And so me and Martha together, we do the dinner party. Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, why would you go back to a, to a book? Why would you go to a series of commands and rules written out for us when you've got God himself, Jesus Christ, who lives where? In you. Isn't that cool? Like he's not, he's not here. He doesn't come and go. He's taken up permanent, permanent residence inside of us. And he's here all the time. And he says, let's, let's live this life together. Well, God, how do I know I'm measuring up? How do I know that my behavior is good enough? He says, it just is. Because it's not about your behavior. You're okay. You're, you're completely okay. But God, but God, but God, what about this? What about this? And I think he gives us this one simple instruction, a command, but not one of performing to measure up, but just simply something to do. And he's given it to us through Paul in Galatians chapter 5. Paul wrote this to the Galatians. He says, it is for freedom that Christ sets you free. Let that sink in. Why did Jesus set you free? So you can serve? So you can give and you can help out and you can witness and evangelize and, and do and do and do? Is that why he set us free so we get up now an army of slaves? No, he set you free to be free. You're free. How free? Free only has one free, right? I mean, if you're not completely free, you're not free at all. Like, he set you free for the whole point to be free. So now what? Stand firm. Keep, therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject again to a yoke of slavery. What's the yoke of slavery? It's not sin. It's the law. He says, now that you've been set free, don't go back to the law system. Don't be saved by grace and now go live by the law. No, 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 no. You've been saved by grace. Now let's live by grace. Let's live by Jesus Christ. Let's trust him to lead, to guide, to express his life through you and stand firm. I love that language, stand firm. It's not go out and get. It's not advance your territory. It's not accomplish. It's just hold what is already yours. Stand firm. And the instruction here is to nobody else but you. See, people often ask me the question, well, what do I do when someone else puts me under law? And as my daughter would say, that's a fallacy. I don't know what that means yet. That's why she says it and I didn't say it, right? What is, but it means it's, no one can put you under law. I mean, I, I, I could try and put flow under law. How, how's the draft problem going on? I mean, just between you and me, it's still there. We'll talk later, right? And, and you guys can remind him from time to time to not think about drafts. So that would help too, I think, right? No one can put flow under law except who? But flow. Nobody can put me under law but me. So the instruction is not to other people. The instruction is to you. Stand firm in what's true. You are God's beloved. He approves you. He accepts you. You are righteous. You are holy. You are pure. You are clean. And it doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what you said this morning. And it doesn't matter what you're going to do next week. Because it's all based on Jesus and what he has done. Apart from works. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we celebrate this incredible truth of your grace, of your life in us and your power. And you have set us free to experience life in you. We don't, we don't experience and find life in, in a rule book or in principles or in guidelines. We find life in a person. You are eternal life. I prayed, Lord, that you would, you would encourage us to stand firm, to hold on to the truth that we are loved and we are acceptable and we are approved by you. But because of what you've done on the cross, we are enough. And that we would now begin to trust you to lead us, to guide us, and to live through us day by day. That why this world can see what you've given to us. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.